This is EE3720, week 6, lecture 2. So today, we are going to look at the, some of the basic rules for sketching root locus. So recall that we had our root locus criterion based of, uh, on our classic um, feedback system architecture. So basically what we have is this implies from the block diagram that the closed loop poles must satisfy this root locus criterion. So I'm going to write it as observed value 2k plus 1 pi at a in angle right there. Okay. And the example we were using last lecture, I believe, is G of S was there was one pole one zero at negative two and three poles at negative three, negative four, negative five, and we used unity feedback for simplicity. Just to illustrate the ideas. Now, what I'll do is I'll write out the basic rules for sketching root locus. And some of them I'll justify immediately using our example, but uh, some of the rules we'll look at towards the end of this lecture when we almost complete the root locus for this function. Because I recall from last time, based on the shape, we need uh, one of the advanced rules, that is refining the root locus sketch rules, which we will cover in next lecture. But for now, uh, let's look at the basic rules. So the first rule, if you will, is the number of branches of the root locus equals number of closed loop poles. And I'll also justify these when I can, because one of the rules we cannot justify, so because the Math required is beyond your skill set, but it's easy to understand all these rules. Uh, so justify, you know, justification. We see that any closed loop pole, first of all, must satisfy one. Okay, so let's call it must satisfy one hence if we define and that's how we define a branch if we, if we define a branch as the path that one pole takes as we as k as we vary k let me underline some important is define a branch as the path that one pole takes as we vary k then there will be one branch for each closed Pole. Okay, so for our example, we have looking at this, we'll have three closed loop poles. Okay, we know this. So, example in our system, we will have three branches. That's the first rule. The second rule is the root locus is symmetrical about the real axis. Okay? So the justification for this is uh, pretty obvious in the sense we've been dealing with this throughout 3050 and 3720 that uh, since 
poles for physical systems always occur in complex conjugate pairs and this is because we want to avoid uh, when we take the uh, time when we take the inverse Laplace transform and obtain the time function we don't want complex coefficients uh, the root locus must be symmetrical about the real axis because we don't want a complex pole just hanging out in like quote unquote in air without its conjugate. Now the third rule we discussed last lecture towards the end of last lecture that is on the real axis for k greater than zero the root locus exists to the left of an odd number let me save this number of real axis finite open loop poles and or finite open loop zeros and the justification is basically the angle criterion from one equation one which I numbered earlier is the angle criterion in one so recall last lecture so basically what we had is that if you look at the angle so we had a zero at negative two pole at negative three pole at negative four pole at negative five so this must so whenever you the real axis only the real axis segment we consider because it's very easy to find the angle from the open loop zero and the open loop poles to real axis segments that is it's either 180 degrees or zero degrees okay so right here there is one segment because the angle from this zero to any point here is 180 degrees and the angle from all these poles is zero so the sum should be an odd multiple some of the angles the angle criterion says that some of the angles must be an odd multiple of 180 so you can have a segment there and you can have a segment there okay now note that because note that based on our definition of a complex vector we only consider finite because poles at uh, and zeros at infinity we will deal actually in the next rule Only finite poles and or zeros now the fourth rule speaking about poles uh, pole, infinite poles and zeros this rule nicely deals with it in the sense the root locus always starts at finite and infinite poles of g of s h of s and ends at finite and infinite zeros of g of s times h of s 
and the justification is the magnitude criterion from one that is magnitude of GSP I mean uh, the magnitude of the closed loop poles of G times H should satisfy so we're just looking at the magnitude so this implies two things that is if the right hand side tends to infinity this implies so this is when k tends to zero this implies let me try to write this neatly let me save this but basically this implies that the left hand side obviously should also tend to infinity and this occurs by definition at poles of g times h likewise as k tends to as we crank up k the right hand side tends to zero this implies the left hand side should also tend to zero and this occurs at zeros of g times h okay so in other words what we can do is for our example So for our example, we can actually augment it. That is, we can add arrows. So here is minus 2, minus 3. Again, the poles of G times H. Okay. So we're going to start at, as K starts at 0, we're going to start at the poles. And then we're going to go to a 0. So it's kind of obvious that this branch goes like that. But then the question is, what happens, so we start like this, go out, so what happens here, okay? We can kind of guess, based on this rule, that this seg that we're going to have symmetrical segments, but how do they go? Well, that's the final simple rule for today's lecture, that is called the behavior at infinity, that is, as we crank up k, as k tends to infinity, the root locus approaches straight line asymptotes with real axis intercepts sigma a and angle theta a given by sigma a is the sum of finite poles minus the sum of finite zeros divided by the number of finite poles minus the number of finite zeros okay and theta a is 2k plus 1 pi divide by number again of finite poles minus number finite zeros okay and then k is 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 dot 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 and the justification is beyond this beyond your skill sets but this rule is easy to apply so beyond your this I'm talking about the 37 20 students beyond your skill set but rule is easy to apply in the sense for our example we have sigma a recall that let me just write it in the sense uh oh oh super so g of s is s plus 2 over s plus 3 times s plus 4 times s plus 5 h of s is again 1 this implies 
sigma a is the sum of the finite poles are at poles at minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, only finite, minus sum of the finite zeros, minus 2 divided by 3 minus 1. So this is 4, uh, 8, 12. So this is uh, negative 12 minus, so it's minus 10 over 2, so it's a negative 5. And the angle theta a is 2k plus 1 pi over 3 minus 1, which is 2k plus 1 times pi over 2. So for k equals 0, you get an asymptote at pi over 2. Then you get 1 at negative pi over 2 for k equals minus 1. For k equals plus 1, you get 3 pi over 2. And now it repeats. So it's dot, dot, dot. Therefore, if you want to augment our sketch, what we'll finally get for this lecture is, okay, so let's put everything together. In the sense, here is the 0. Here are the poles. So what we have, let me start using different colors. So you know that we can look at the branches as well. So there you go, there's one. Uh, so we start at the finite and our in this case we only we have finite poles so and we'll talk about actually the finite zero and also the there are two infinite zeros as you will see sh very shortly but anyway we started the poles for log k and as k cranks up we go to the zero here and that's how one closed loop pole moves remember we have three closed loop pole moves we have three closed loop poles so there's the second one and there's the third one okay since and finally here are our asymptotes let's put that in so here's the asymptote there are two asymptotes okay, here's one and then here's another one so now the question is what happens to these two branches now there is a Interesting result from complex analysis that says that we have, if we have three, in this case, the number, okay, the result says the number of poles should be equal to the number of zeros, both finite and infinite, for a rational transfer function. In this case, we have three finite poles for G of S, that on, we have only one finite zero, so we should have two more zeros, which are at infinity, okay, so that's exactly what happens uh, to these two branches in the sense remember that as k goes to infinity we should end up at zeros that are finite and infinite so one branch say goes this way okay, and it's an asymptote so it's infinite behavior this is behavior at infinity sorry so you get that from one branch to the other branch does this notice actually that we have two branches, but the basically the poles occur in complex conjugate pairs. In other words, our root locus is symmetrical about the real axis. And so notes, number one, uh, we satisfy rules one and two. That is, we have three branches corresponding to, so branch one, branch two, branch three, corresponding to three closed loop poles and the root locus is symmetrical about the real axis, rules 1 and 2 respectively. Uh, second, let us check our answer in MATLAB. So for those of you not viewing the lecture video, we'll use CISO tool, and here it is. I've already done this right before I started recording this, and I had some uh, error here. So, but anyway, to find my transfer function, I mean, to find my s variable, to find my transfer function, then used CISO tool uh, architecture. So imported the loop data and adjusted the compensator or adjusted the plot. So I only see root locus, not the body plots. But there it is, and you can see that for low gain, let me see if this works. I start at the poles. And then I start moving towards the zero, and you can see I do have, have it asymptotically going. The asymptotes are at negative five pi over two, negative five, uh, three pi over two. 
But now the question is, how do you find out this point where you can call it the breakaway point because that's where the root locus branches off from the real axis? And the answer to that we will give next lecture where we will look at three rules. Uh, so we'll refine the root locus sketch. So basically, we look at three properties breakaway, break in points, j omega axis. Uh, Undefined root locus sketch. So breakaway break in points, j omega axis crossings, and angles of departure and arrival from complex poles and zeros. All right. See you next time.